I often read comments that I don't review enough cars for the ordinary people here on the Mark Drive channel. I'm happy to report today I have two ordinary cars for ordinary people. Join me for a battle between the Hyundai Hyundai i30 and the Peugeot 308 and both are estates or station wagons. So much win! Let's meet the contenders. In the red corner, the third generation facelifted Hyundai i30. This is the M line trim, which is like the M pack for BMW. A few sporty details and a slight suspension and steering tuning, but nothing is done to the engine. This test car is powered by a 1.5 liter, 160 horsepower engine with a mild hybrid. It is mated to a 7 speed DCT with options. This car costs around 35,000 euro. In the black corner, it should have been vertigo blue, but the press office ordered a black one. The Peugeot 308 second generation facelift. This is the Allure Pack trim with a 1.5 liter diesel engine, 130 horsepower, 8 speed automatic. With a few options, it costs around 34,000 euros. I'll let you decide on the looks. The station wagon is a difficult body style to design. Either it's going to look good or it's going to be practical. Let me know in the comment section below which one looks better in your opinion. A few words about the equipment. Both cars get full LED headlights, optional. Both cars get keyless access and ignition, lane keeping assist, sat nav, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, collision warning with brake assist, but only Hyundai can have optional cross-traffic monitoring system. As for reversing cameras, Hyundai gets an ordinary camera, while Peugeot has that fake 360 camera, which stitches the image as you reverse. Boots. If not for the mild hybrid, Hyundai would have won at 602 liters, including the underflow storage. However, traction battery for the mild hybrid takes up a bit of space, so there's only 493 liters. Fold the back seats and you get 1,541 liters. There are no backrest releases in the boot and there is no place for the cargo cover. However, there are three shopping bag hooks and a 12-volt socket. The Peugeot boot has 556 liters volume, 1,606 with the seats down. There are handles to fold the back seats from the boot side. The boot cover fits under the floor. There is a 12-volt socket close to the passenger compartment, but there are no shopping bag hooks. Even with a diesel engine, the Peugeot is almost 40 kilograms lighter than the Hyundai. However, the Hyundai has over 20 kilograms higher load capacity. Of course, you have to take into account passengers as well as the luggage. Each of these cars can take more than 550 kilograms on board. I couldn't find this much, but I did load it up with some tires and I had three people to help me. Overall, we weigh together with the tires about 450 kilograms. Let's see how that impacts the driving distance. What are we looking at here? First, I set a benchmark with an empty car. It's slippery and snowy, so this is not a tire test. For this demonstration, I am driving 50 km per hour, which is the urban speed limit in most of Europe. For the next part, I ask three big blokes to join me, and just to add a bit more weight, we put rims and tires in the boot. Together, they add up to one more hefty adult. By the way, you can see Peugeot's boot is deeper, and takes one more wheel, which didn't fit in the Hyundai. With this extra load, Hyundai braking distance is 2.2 meters longer. In case of the Peugeot, it was almost 3 meters. Interesting, as the empty Peugeot stopped sooner than the Hyundai. Again, this is not a tire review. And by the way, later in the snow, Nokians on the Peugeot proved much better than the Continentals on the Hyundai. So there must have been another factor at play. Perhaps it was the Hyundai's slightly stiffer suspension, or maybe I started braking a fraction of a second earlier? Any theories? Let me know in the comment section below. But the takeaway here is, extra mass means longer stopping distance, so be careful. In the back, Peugeot has a USB port which the Hyundai lacks. Both cars get armrests with cup holders. In the Hyundai, the door pockets accommodate water bottles, but not in the Peugeot. In both cars there is a ski hatch, the Hyundai offers a bit more headroom and legroom, 
with the driver's seat set for 175 centimeters tall driver like myself. However, in the Peugeot, the dash is designed in such a way that you can push the passenger's seat forward and mount a rear-facing child seat in the back easier than in the Hyundai. Things are getting more interesting in the cockpit. While Hyundai has a relatively ordinary instrument panel, the Peugeot's virtual instrument cluster is raised above the smaller steering wheel, the idea being that the driver has all the necessary information within their line of sight and doesn't need to glance down or to the side. The devil is in the details. For example, in the Hyundai, speed limit information is not displayed on the instrument cluster, but only on the satnav map. That's if you use the OEM satnav rather than Android Auto. Also, there is a glitch in the system that plays pre-installed Sounds of Nature every time it can't find the previously played media source like a Bluetooth phone. And that's quite annoying after some time. Meanwhile, the infotainment system in the Peugeot is so bad, you only want to use Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. Unfortunately, in order to change climate control settings, you need to use the touch screen, and that means exiting your external interface. Regardless of the trim level, Peugeot now has a digital instrument cluster as standard. You can finally display all the information you need, but toggling between the modes takes a while. The Hyundai gets heated steering wheel and heated seats, part of an equipment package. In the Peugeot you can specify heated seats, but this test car doesn't have them. On a positive note, the Pugs heater is very effective. Both cars get only one USB port in the front, but the Hyundai has two 12 volt sockets. In the i30 there is a lot of place for your everyday items, dark cup holders, large door pockets. In the Peugeot only the glove box is deep, everything else is small, and why is there only one cup holder, since even in the rear there are two? Hyundai wants you to get good gas mileage, or rather keep the emissions down, so the i30 always starts in eco mode. Not in normal, not in sport, but always in eco. They could have just dropped the normal mode altogether and just leave eco and sport. Around the city, I managed to get around 6 liters per 100 kilometers, which is what Hyundai promises combined. I recall the fastback I reviewed a few years ago with a 1.4 100 horsepower petrol engine used around 8 liters in the city. Is the i30 N line particularly sporty to drive? I'd say it's rather comfortable. From the pre facelift review, I remember quick steering and nothing has changed in this department. The engine is quiet, the gearbox keeps up with my driving style. Hyundai promises the i30 with this engine should do 0 to 100 km per hour in 8.8 .8 seconds. I got just above 9, but the road was slightly wet and the front wheels kept losing traction off the line. Visibility front and to the sides is okay, but the rear window is at a weird angle, so it's not great when looking outside. However, during parking maneuvers, you do have a reversing camera. The camera is not the only help you get. Hyundai collectively calls driver aids Smart Sense. The package includes things like lane assist, reversing cross traffic alert, autonomous braking, or attention monitor to let you know the car in front has moved. Also, the blind spot monitoring system is now improved. It can even engine brake to avoid a collision. The front collision mitigating system is now better at recognizing cyclists. Unfortunately, I couldn't find anyone willing to be my guinea pig. There is also a system monitoring your attention levels while driving. Good thing there are automatic high beams. Hyundai may offer full LED headlights as part of the convenience package, but these come with manual leveling adjustment and that means brightness below 2000 lumens, so less bright than most Xenon headlamps. On a dark road, you need high beams. And now let's check out the Pug.
how is it to drive like a compact estate? With 300 Nm of torque, it shifts when it has to. Once the engine is up to temperature, it's relatively quiet. The automatic gearbox works well enough. I wouldn't race it, though I'm sure sales reps have set some record times in cars like these. Peugeot claims the 0 to 100 km per hour time of 9.7 seconds and 6.8 seconds from 80 to 120 km per hour. Again, on a somewhat damp road, I managed 10.5 seconds 0 to 100 km per hour and around 7.5 seconds from 80 to 120 km per hour. Once you're up to speed, the brakes bite quite high and the car stops very quickly. The Peugeot 308 SW can carry almost 570 kilograms, that's six of me. Assuming you don't overload the car and you're gentle with the throttle, you should get the claimed 4.8 liters per 100 kilometers combined. I suspect on warmer days I could get even a better result, but during my week with the 308 we have temperatures drop below minus 10 degrees Celsius and the computer turned off the stop and start system off. With a 53-liter tank, you should get about 1,000 km range. By the way, the 1.5-liter, 130-horsepower diesel replaced the 120-horsepower, 1.6 diesel, but the 180-horsepower, 2-liter diesel is gone. Driver aids work well enough. A word of caution about the traffic sign recognition system, it is only camera based and there doesn't seem to be a sign database in the satnav. On the plus side, it works even with the Android Auto plugged in, something that doesn't always work in all cars. The suspension is comfortable enough, but not too soft. It's not Citroen C4 or C4 Cactus level of comfort, but I could do long journeys in the 308 SW any day. There's lumbar support adjustment, the seat is relatively long, but at the same time quite narrow. Visibility and soundproofing are <laughs> average. Depending on the spec, LED headlamps may be standard or part of an equipment package. For this model, full LED pack costs 950 euro and it's worth paying for as regular halogen headlights aren't bright enough. I still enjoy this small steering wheel and how it impacts the driving feel. Peugeot's with that small steering wheel have that go-karty feel even though the iCockpit was designed with visibility in mind, not driving fun. Having driven both of these cars for a few hundred kilometers, I appreciate Peugeot for its comfort and how frugal the engine is. However, I prefer the Hyundai interior for its layout. With a mild hybrid, the i30 loses some of the estate's practicality, but with a diesel engine, this would be a proper motorway cruiser. And which one of these cars would you choose? Let me know in the comment section below. If you like my sarcastic, down-to-earth and possibly mildly amusing car reviews, join me every Friday at 3 p.m. Central European time and don't forget to subscribe and like this video as it helps me with the YouTube algorithm. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.